So the title of today's talk, Nirvana is Seeing Something Through to the End, it comes from Shinra Suzuki. That's actually a quote from Shinra Suzuki. And the subtitle would be, Persevere, Persevere, Persevere. I ask in my email, what, what, would, what is that one thing that if you finish it all the way to the end would have a positive transformational impact on your life? And then I sat with a blank piece of paper for a long time after that. <laughs> Mostly because there's so much to be said about that, and I didn't know which directions I was being called to go. So the direction I'm not being called to go, but I really think it's a valuable question, is what is, it's very tangible, is what is that one thing, if you picked that one thing and you did it all the way to the end, what would that one thing be for you right now in your life? And when I'm, ask, I'm asking you that question, not like the one thing that you know if your family member did, they would transform, or your friend, but you, <laughs> right now. <laughs> well, and, and so pretty much anything that we choose that's somewhat positive, a skill, a craft, you want to be in the best shape of your life, you want to learn a new language, you want to learn a new instrument, anything that we choose, say, this is one thing I really want to get good at, and give ourselves to it, and we and went all the way to the end to me, means to me some level of mastery in that topic. We're going to become better people because of it. It's going to shift us, not just externally, but internally. To, to develop mastery in anything requires inner shifts. So that's just a lovely question to ask in general about our daily life. But I really want to take it onto the spiritual realm of our inherent freedom, since that's our theme for the month, Freedom Finders. And we're using this book uh, by... Anthony Ray Hinton called The Sun Does Shine. True story. So for those of you who weren't here last week, it's just a gentle reminder that the story is about uh, Anthony Ray Hinton, who was arrested in 1985 for the murder of three people in Alabama and is convicted of the murders and put on death row. And he's innocent. The, The evidence against him is pretty obvious but he doesn't have a good lawyer, doesn't have the money for a good lawyer. And uh, he does eventually become, it gets overturned and he's set free, but that's 30 years later. So he spends 30 years in prison, 28 years, 28 years of those 30 years were on death row. So to read his book, and it's one thing to hear it, but to hear what it's like to live day, you're just losing years of your life, all the dreams that you have. He's went in when he was 29, that those decades that we think of as our most fruition, where where we're creating and doing a lot of stuff, we're youthful, we have a lot of energy, all those years are ticking by, month after month, year after year, decade after decade. What does that do to a person's soul? That's the persevere, persevere, persevere. For some people, it comes easily and effortlessly. Their innocence, their free life, but for others, there is this incredible struggle, and we don't know why. We don't, one of the challenges that, I've, that we have on the spiritual life is our, the way we compare ourselves to other people. Well, look, they just mastered this. They got this down. Why is it so hard for me? We all have different journeys. There's a mystery to it, and these journeys are all beautiful. They touch us and transform us. I just happened to watch a movie. I wasn't planning on talking about this, but just sort of where I'm going. Uh, I happened to see, um, it was a, a TV series on British TV years ago called, based on the Thomas Hardy's book, The Mayor of Casterbridge. And I was so moved by it because there's a character in that where he is just a really good guy. And everything just seems to work out for him. He's good at business, and he's young. And so this older guy, he's crotch- he can be mean, really mean, deceptive, betrayal. I don't know if, how many of you know the story. I'm not going to get into the story. My only point with it is I'm watching it. Of course, we like the good guy. He's a, just a nice, kind, generous human being. But the main story is about this sort of mean guy, but then he repents. And then he'll totally own up to the stuff that he did that was bad and be an incredible integrity in repairing the damage. And you're like, yes. And then he does it again. He deceives somebody else. And you're like, no, no, don't do that, don't do that. He, he falls into it again. And then he's really mean again. And then, he re- and then it goes back and forth. And as I'm watching it, he's the one that moved me. 
I just was rooting for him and feeling so sad and just seeing him struggle with his own soul. This, 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 uh, I, was, I was talking to Jack that we get into these superhero movies of good and bad, and within him you can see the battle within him so powerfully, and you're rooting for him. And I didn't think, oh, why doesn't he have such a nice life as this good guy over here where everything seems to work out? There was something about that struggle that I could relate to that moved me, that transformed me, and I just found myself not only rooting for him, but grateful that he kept persevering, that he would fall again, do something terrible again, and was mean and nasty again. But he didn't quit. Then he would try to rectify it. And I just thought, just keep showing up to life. And that seems so much of our journey to freedom on this human plane is about continuing to persevere, that we have these moments of incredible liberation. We can be in meditation and prayer. Things are, everything's flowing and we're flying and then bam, we're caught in some human spider web, some habit pattern that glitches us. We get stuck in something that, well, I've been here before. I've been here a thousand times before. Here I am again. We're right back in it again. And so we have to to do our spiritual work to become free another time. Has anyone else experienced that? Oh, yeah. oh good. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. So that perseverance of, of continuing on, and I think what keeps us persevering is what we were talking about last week, is that absolute conviction that we are innocent, that ultimately every one of us is inherently innocent, that each and every one of us absolutely is good, that each and every one of, of us absolutely not only deserves, but is love itself. That that's who we are. That is always who we are. And no matter how much we screw up, no matter how stuck we might get on these bad habits or these limitations, that is the truth of who we are. And we have to hold on to that light all of the time. As Ernest Holmes says, none of these practices do any good unless you're practicing them when the times get the hardest. That's when they become the most important to do the practices. When we fall back into that old system, then we don't say, oh, this doesn't work. Well, we continue to persevere. We continue to practice. We continue in the midst of that darkness. There's something so beautiful in that. It's one of those things I can't tangibly articulate, but I feel it so deeply when I watch other people, not me, other people, going through that journey. (laughs) And, and because with me, I'm in it, so I can't see it when I'm in it. But I can, so that's why it helps me to see it in other people. Because when I have compassion and love for them, then it reminds me to have compassion and love for myself. That's the beautiful thing about having a spiritual journey, is people mirror to us how we feel about ourselves and can teach us how to treat ourselves better. Because often we're more generous with other people than we are with ourselves. So the question becomes, I believe in my freedom. Ray Hinton knew that he was innocent. There was, there was no equivocation that he was for himself. So the question is, how are we going to become free? He's given a lawyer at the beginning of his trial. The lawyer is not very good. The lawyer is not very invested in him. So there's millions of spiritual practices out there, tens of thousands of spiritual teachers People are going to offer their help. There's a system. You can get someone to help you, I'll help you become free, but really they're not invested in your freedom. They might not even be free themselves. They might be more free than you, but still not that free. So I don't think the lawyer that first helped him or was his first lawyer was a bad person. I just He was ill-equipped to help Ray and didn't really want to because Ray didn't have the money. Brian Stevenson, the lawyer who is featured in, who, who ultimately does get Ray freed and is featured in a documentary on HBO I've talked about before, wrote a book called Just Mercy. He says it's better to be rich and guilty than poor and innocent because so much of our justice system is about money. Ray couldn't afford a good lawyer. He was convicted for all these years in prison. The next two lawyers that he gets are people from Brian Stevenson's organization, and they help him. So we have different spiritual tools along the way. We have different teachers. We have different books. We learn. I've I've mentioned this statistic before, but I'll refresh our memory. Uh, um, Michael Murphy, the founder of Esalen, co-founder of Esalen, 
started in the early 1970s categorizing different spiritual techniques and practices for people to become free. And he was in the 10,000s where he just got worn out because there were so many more to go, and he just said there's just way too many. And that was almost 50 years ago. I, I don't think it's hy hyperbolic to say there's millions of spiritual practices and techniques and teachers and tools that are available to us all of the time. Just get on the computer, go anywhere, books galore, teachers galore from the past, from the present, even some from other planets. We got them all. So the question is, what's, what's that person? So if we decide we really get that we're innocent, I, just, I want to go back to this, of knowing not just that we're innocent, but that we're inherently free and that we deserve that freedom here on this planet. I remember a teacher saying to me once, that what they saw, one of the problems with the Eastern teaching, teaching of reincarnation was that often they found in, that people who believed in reincarnation would be like, well, if I don't get it this time, I can get it in the next life, or it's, I've got lots of time. One of the advantages in growing up in my house with agnostic and atheists, there is nothing but this time. There, they didn't believe that there was a future, so there was an immediacy. It's got to happen now. My freedom has to be found now, and there's no freedom on, there's no heaven, so if I'm going to find any, any good, it's got to be right now. There's limitations to that as well, obviously, but one of the advantages of it is it's now. And so the question, and I had a friend, because I remember it stuck with me, because I had a friend who, who is on the spiritual journey, who said to me, I love being on the spiritual journey, but I'm not striving for enlightenment. I'm not striving to be free, because I don't think that's possible for me. That, I see that's going to be future lives, but that's not really my focus this life. And that was sort of startling to me. I thought, well, why wouldn't you want to be? If you could be utterly free now, why would you want to wait for another lifetime? It's not right or wrong. We got to a place of peace where we agreed to disagree, <laughs> which is the great thing about being on our journey. So I think the first question we all have to ask ourselves, being on the spiritual journey, is why am I on the spiritual journey? What do I want from the spiritual journey? Do I believe that I deserve and can be in utter unlimited bliss, unconditional love that is beyond duality, that isn't swinging back and forth between these pendulums of duality, that doesn't feel imprisoned or limited, but feels utterly open and oceanic in our love and our joy and our harmony and our creativity and our peace. And we're so alive and so full of energy and vitality, not just some of the time, but all of the time, that everywhere we go, we see beauty because we are seeing and feeling from the heart of our own divine beauty. Wouldn't we want to live that utter freedom now? And I believe the reason why we get a little distracted is because we're not quite sure if it's possible. So I just want to keep reiterating that point of how much do we really believe we deserve it? As I'm reading Anthony Ray's book, he knows he deserves, using that as a metaphor, the prison as a metaphor, he knows he deserves to be free. He's unrelenting. So he gets these lawyers that get him part of the way they're good lawyers. They're part of Brian Stevenson's organization. They're doing good work by him, but still things are moving slowly, and they're not, they're not totally invested in him. They're busy. They're doing other things. They, are, they have busy lives. The second, uh, so not the second lawyer, the third lawyer, uh, he knew he didn't like immediately because uh, um, he was a Red Sox fan. Sorry for Red Sox fans, but he didn't like Red Sox, people, Red Sox fans. And he was joking, but that was part of his humor. But the, and the, the lawyer came to him so excited, and he said, look, I just got you a great deal. We did it. I got you so you don't have to die. I got you off death row, and you can now be life without parole in prison. You don't have to die. I mean, but because remember, it's not just theoretical. He's only a few blocks away, cells away from the death, the electric chair. And he is experiencing people dying in that electric chair, the stench of their skin, them sobbing and crying and in agony. So it's not some theoretical thing. You're not going to be on death row. That is kind of a big thing. You don't have to be in death row anymore. You can be in regular prison population, have a lot more freedom, and you're not going to you're not have to smell people dying. You don't have to see it or experience it. You get to be in this other world. So it's definitely a step up. But Anthony Ray Hinton, I, I keep saying Anthony, he goes by Ray, 
absolutely knew he was free. He knew who he was. He never relented. He persevered. No, I want to my ultimate freedom. I'm not willing to accept anything less than my ultimate freedom, period. And he fired the lawyer. This is Brian Stevens, and this guy's a good guy. He's not a bad guy. On our spiritual path, do we have teachers? Do we have practices? And do we think they're going to take us all the way to the end? Nirvana is seeing something all the way through to the end. Do we have teachers? Do we have practices that are going to take us all the way? Not just part of the way, not just because it makes life a little bit better, but all the way to our ultimate freedom. Great question to ask ourselves. That if I continue to persevere on this path, I will gain ultimate freedom. Ray had at this point, and I talked at the very end of the talk last week where he had that moment where he realized he wasn't a victim all the time, that there, he had choice. There, he could choose to be kind to his neighbors, no matter what, in death row, and suddenly it changed the whole environment in which he was living. And that came also with his lawyer. He decided, you know what, I, don't, I want Brian Stevenson as my lawyer, and I'm not willing to settle anymore, just take whoever's given to me, whoever shows up in my reality. So he writes Brian Stevenson a letter arguing his case as to why Brian should be his lawyer, that he needs to take on his case. And then the same day he mails the letter, he calls Brian Stevenson's office. Brian takes the call, on the, in, in, clearly in a hurry, takes the call. And he says, I, you're, I just sent you a letter in the mail. You need to expect it. It's coming from me. It's about my case. You need to take my case. He didn't just leave this to chance. He didn't say, I'm sending the letter and I'm going to surrender to what it is. He followed up immediately with a phone call. I remember reading that. I thought, that's someone who's serious. He's not messing around. He's not just like, well, maybe if it's God's will, Brian will see my letter. You will see my letter, and I need your response. He took control of his own, what mattered to him. I need to be free, and I've got to find the person, the path, the technique that's going to get me free, and I'm not willing to accept anything else less than that ever again. And so Brian does agree to meet him, and they click. It's immediate, and he knows, and he, but he continues to fight for why Brian should take the case. Brian takes the case. What's amazing is that Brian, well, first of all, Already a difference in the way Brian approaches the case and the other lawyers. He actually allows Ray to participate. What do you think we should do? He's now, Ray is now participating in his own freedom. It's not just what the lawyers are telling him. It's not just a teacher saying, here's the techniques, here's the principles. He's participating. Well, what do you think you need to do for freedom? What do you think would help this case? And he came, had great ideas. He understood certain things about the South that, that the other lawyers didn't understand about the South. Brian cared about him. Brian sent him notes and cards. Brian got the top experts, ballistic efforts. The only real evidence they had was they said, the three bullets that killed these people came from the gun from your mother's house. And they had had some ballistic experts that said this was true. And Ray knew it wasn't true. And Ray's the one who told them where the gun was. He said, oh, yeah, my grandma has a gun. He, I mean, he didn't think of it, anything of it. So Brian Stevenson gets the top experts in the country, there's absolutely no way these bullets came from your mother's gun. So that's the only proof that they had, and it's completely dissuaded. That's in 2002. Ray doesn't actually get free and let out till 2015. That's 13 years. There's no evidence convicting him any more of this crime. The lawyers know that he's free, but they go through all this bureaucracy and the procedural stuff, and it ultimately has to be taken to the Supreme Court in order to set him free. Brian keeps fighting for him. And always he says, hang in there. Because when you have that, you can't keep coming up against those many walls. You just start saying, what's the point? You know, it's obvious, but I can't get there. I do all these spiritual practices. I know I'm free, but I keep doing these same things over and over. I keep screwing up. Why do I even bother? What's the point? Why don't I give up? And that's when we need people to say, no, and you matter, and I'm here with you. It's taking longer than we thought. We understand, but hang in there. Keep trying. I'm with you. And that's why spiritual community, spiritual teachers are so important to us because there gets to those points where we just feel like it's better to give up than to keep going. 
We know it's not that we don't believe that we're innocent, but it's just no matter how much I know that I'm free and unlimited, glorious expression of God, I keep, in this particular, using it spiritually, I keep running into these walls. I keep running these blocks, and no matter what I do, I just can't get through them. I quit. Don't quit. I'm with you. I don't care how long it's going to take. No matter how many years it's going to take, I'm with you. That's what true spiritual teachers and teaching and techniques will do, that they sustain us through those most difficult and challenging times. Who are the teachers? What are the techniques that you are committed to that you know that will take you all the way to your divine inheritance? That that idea, that concept that you can be free is not just some abstract idea, but it's a living reality today in this world now, in your lifetime. Before you leave this planet, it is a possibility and a reality that you can actually become that embodied saint. And I say saint because I just thought of Yogananda's quote, is a saint is just a sinner who never gave up. (laughs) We can become that living guru, teacher, awakened being, that person that is fully alive. But we need to claim that teacher. We need to claim that path. I'm just thinking, even Jesus, when people asked him, not everyone got healed by him. And some of the people, the stories of people asking for that healing, they just sort of beg him, like, please heal. He didn't just go around healing everybody. You had to ask. You had to choose. You had to say, you can do this. I know you can. You had to prove that you believed in him if you wanted him to heal. I was even thinking of Sri um, with Yogananda when he found his guru. I just expected, I remember the very first time I read that story, I expected his guru to say, yes, you are my student, and this is what you need to do. But instead he said, well, maybe I am, maybe I'm not. In essence, let's, you have to prove yourself. Show me that you're my student. Yogananda had to claim it. You're my teacher. I know for myself, I had to claim it. My teacher didn't say, I'm your teacher. Here I am. I had to say, no, you're my teacher. I know it. I claim it. I accept it. And I will not accept anything less. What is your path? How much have you claimed your path and said, this is my path? Everyone's giving me millions of teachers and techniques, but I know my path, I claim it, and I'm unrelenting. I'm going to stay with this teacher, I'm going to stay with this technique, I'm going to stay with this path, and sometimes it feels like it's not working. You know, on the surface, it can look like, well, Brian Stevenson wasn't doing any better than the lawyer, original lawyer, because, you know, 13 more years, he was still in death row. But you knew he was making progress. He was so Uh, qualitatively different. The entire experience was different, and he totally knew who Ray was. We become discerning. Some techniques don't work because they're really not our right techniques. Some teachers don't work because they're really not our right teachers. For us, they might be good for someone else. They're not our right teachers. But just because we're with the right teacher or with the right technique, that doesn't mean instant transformation. There's still those dry periods where it doesn't seem like anything happened or difficult time, but what we do is we continue to work. I've always loved the movie Charlotte Shank Redemption. And to me, that's just such a, such a great metaphor, the whole movie, beginning to end. Just watch it and just say, this is all a metaphor for a spiritual journey. It's so rich and there's so much that could be said. I mean, use one aspect of it. At one, when Andy Dufresne, who also is innocent, as we all are, inherently innocent. He asks Red, his friend Red, to get him a rock hammer because he wants to make little chess pieces and he gets little rock pieces from the yard and makes these little chess pieces with this little tiny hammer. And we learn, the movie's been out for 25 years so I don't think I'm jumping the gun and telling you the end of the story. (laughs) Spoiler alert. Uh, We learn that with that little rock hammer... Year after year, he's been plugging away at the wall behind the Rita Hayworth picture, and he makes a tunnel to his ultimate freedom with that little rock hammer. What I love about that, years earlier, I had taken Yogananda's course, on, and he has so many ways, as there are so many ways of meditation, and he himself teaches many meditations, but his initial meditation was a mantra, breathe in, hong, breathe out, saw. It's the hong, saw technique. It's their Sanskrit words. 
But uh, Ramana Maharshi said the same thing about I am. He said every time we just say I am, breathe in, I uh, exhale, am, we are shifting our awareness to the I amness of the universe. And so the more times we just say I am with our breath throughout the day, we're actually having a huge impact on our own spiritual growth. When Yogananda teaches this Hong Sa, so that's, these are called mantra meditations. In the more Christian tradition, they call it prayer without ceasing. It could be a longer phrase. Everywhere I go, I'm surrounded and enfolded in pure unconditional love. Or, you know, it could be a long phrase or a short phrase. But it's, it's a, a something that you say over and over, preferably with your breath. When Yogananda introduces this, it's the beginner's method to meditation. He really introduces it at, yes, it can make you free, but it's just a beginner. Ultimately, if you give yourself to it, it will make you free. But there's other methods, and he goes on and teaches many other meditation techniques. And there was something in my mind when I read that. I thought, well, that I want to know that this most simple one can make me free. And that's what I loved about Shawshank Redemption. He didn't get a shovel. He didn't get a plow. He didn't have some great big escape plan. It was a little rock hammer, that little tool that says, I am, I am. Nobody sees it. He didn't talk about it. It wasn't some great big spiritual teaching, not classes, not these big elaborate systems to become free. It was just a little tool that seemed so innocent, that seemed like it couldn't do any, any real damage. That's why they let him have the rock hammer. They knew he had it. But what can you do with a rock hammer? What can you do with this little mantra saying, I am, all day long? That's not doing anything, and yet... Year after year, for 19 years, he's saying the I am, I am. He's chipping away at that tunnel and breaking us free, breaking himself free to the ultimate freedom because he believed, again, unrelenting, I'm innocent, I don't belong in this prison. I don't belong in these, this small, limited identity, these habit patterns that keep me constricted. I, I need to be my free self, and he was going to find that tool that was going to get him free, and for him it was that rock hammer. So my invitation this week is to continue to connect with your innocence. That was the homework last week. And that's the homework going to be all, all month long because I think we forget our inherent innocence, which is why we get distracted and are willing to accept lesser identities, let lesser experiences. But the more we just keep saying, you know what? I am innocent. I am free of all this stuff, all these judgments, all this bad and good and right and wrong and all these limiting habit patterns, these coverings, these sheaths, as they say in Hinduism. I'm free of all that. That's not who I am. These are just coverings. I'm letting them be peeled off layer after layer so that I become the unlimited joyful being that I am meant to be. And that's who I already am. That's who I was born into this world as, and that's who I am now, and that's how I'm going to leave this world. And I am going to... The more we connect with that, the next step is, and I am unrelenting in realizing that this lifetime, letting go of all ideas that I have to wait till I leave my physical body to, till I experience that, letting go of all ideas that this is for another lifetime, this lifetime, I'm not willing to accept anything but my pure innocence and to be living from my pure innocence and my pure, pure freedom this lifetime. And as we heard in the song today, when we decide that, when we make the decision, the divine meets us and will show us the way. And then we respond. I loved, it was so different. When Ray met Brian, it was a give and take. It wasn't just one way. Anthony was just, or Ray was just as involved in his process, on his court cases, in his opinions, as the, and the lawyer was very invested in his freedom. Who are your teachers? Have you committed to them? Have you committed to your spiritual practices? Do you know your path? And if we don't, I've been, like many of you, I've been on this path for three decades. What I have found is that it just gets narrower and narrower because I need to focus. I can't do all these many things all the time. I just got to focus. Do we know what that is for us? What is the path? What is the teaching that's going to take us all the way to the finish line? That's going to take us to the end. Nirvana is choosing that one thing, choosing that one thing that's going to take us all the way to the end because we believe that at the end is nirvana. The path is nirvana. Nirvana is choosing the path, taking, taking the initiative, speaking that into our reality, and going for it today. Not tomorrow, but today. We claim our freedom today. We claim our teachers today. We claim our path today. And so... 
I'm asking you not just to do that today, but all week. Connect with your innocence. You're always already heaven on earth. It's now. What is your path that will take you all the way to that, not just part of the way? And, and persevere. Are you willing to persevere on that path, on those techniques and that teacher? That you will, no matter what, no matter how hard, no matter how exhausting, I will persevere. So that's a lot. You got a lot of homework to do. <laughs> but we all do, right? I know you're already doing it. This isn't new for most of you. It's just remembering. I, I feel like Sunday services are often just... Because uh, I see so many of you who've been on this path for so long. So I don't think I'm always saying things that are brand new. But I do feel like the intention of these talks is to remind ourselves how important this is. and that it's, Because everything else is telling all these things are important. This is the most important thing. Our freedom is what's most important. And when we connect with it, we know that. But the problem is we get distracted by all these things. We forget how extraordinary our freedom is. So you with me? We're on this path of freedom now, not for another lifetime, but now, this community, now, collectively, we move as a community into and as that freedom. Each one of us, what I love about our communities is that we all, our paths may all be different, our teachers may all be different, but we're all on that same path, that we all know, if we are here, that we deserve that freedom now, and that heaven on earth, nirvana on earth is now. Let's pray. It's now. The divine power and presence and the infinite love intelligence of the universe is now. All that the divine has ever been in the past and all that it will be in the future is right here and right now. There's no more freedom, no more light, no more joy, no more creativity and bliss and love and peace than there is right here in this moment. And that we know and we claim individually and collectively that this is the absolute truth of who and what we are. That there's nothing that we need to change, fix, or to do to make that re- a reality. It already is the absolute reality right now. We can't limit that reality ever. It already is. Pure bliss already is. That infinite giggle that plays within our heart and our joy, in our body, it's already there. That infinite delight that just finds joy wherever it goes. The beauty that radiates and pulsates from every atom and cell of our being is everywhere we look because it is who we are and we see that which we are. The beautiful love, the oceanic love that knows no condition and no limit. It is right here and right now. It can never be limited, hurt, harmed, or endangered ever by any experience on the human plane. It is always already whole, perfect, and complete right here and right now. And each and every one of us is made from, through, and as this one power, this one presence, this one light, this one joy, this one freedom, this one harmony, this one bliss. And that is who we are right here and right now. We have always been and always will be. So we just breathe in that awareness of who and what we always have been. We claim and accept our true identity. And it is in that true identity that we call it forth to be fully activated in all form and all action. We give thanks for that true identity that is revealing itself even now as Michelle Schmidt-Renz that we give thanks for the incredible progress and leaps in her health that are happening even now and are, will continue to happen. We hold the truth and the magnificence of her wholeness right here in this moment, and we surround and support her partner, her husband, Carl, who supports her every step of the way, that he too is supported, that this is a beautiful, radiant couple who knows who they are, and the entire universe is conspiring for their good right in this moment. We celebrate this and we know this here and now. And as we know this for Michelle and Carl, I ask us to call forth anyone in our life, in our family, friends, work life, that are needing to be remembered who they really are in this moment, right now, the truth of their being. Let's call their names out into this wonderful consciousness of oneness.
we know this consciousness of wholeness and oneness, of peace and bliss that has no end is activated even now through these names that have been called forth and is saying yes to revealing itself perfectly in the ways that are needed by each of these individuals. And we know that even as we know this for those who are closest to us, those whose people we don't even know their names, we see pictures of them that are in suffering, that are in pain, that feel that, are, feel that they are invisible, that they are unwanted, that, that are made to be felt guilty, who are in darkness, who are lost. All those people that we know are, exist on this planet. Let's just hold, we'll just say the, those who, ha, who are lost. Everybody, all those we can't see and we don't know their names and yet spirit knows everyone's name. Spirit knows everyone's true self, true heart and we are calling forth the awareness of these beings in our life, these people, these beautiful beings of light, the truth of who and what they really are. And as we know this, we know this about all animals and plants and this beautiful planet in which we are, the truth of who and what these animals and plants and this beautiful planet and cosmos is. Our consciousness here knows no limits and no bounds. We are unlimited beings, and we know this for the entire cosmos. We celebrate the vibrational frequency that is uplifting and transforming all life even now through our collective prayer that each and every one of us is letting go of all those covers and sheaths. Even now, the covers and sheaths have been let go, and we just expand and delight into our inherent heaven-on-earth consciousness right here and right now. We celebrate it. We give thanks. And we know that as we have claimed and accepted here today, it is done. In deep abiding abiding peace and everlasting joy, we release this word into the law of life, knowing that as we have collectively said yes, it is fulfilled here and now, and we say together as one, and so it is. Amen and amen. And so it is. And so it is. And so it is. Ah. Uh-huh.